Okay, so this morning we are going to begin the second letter that John wrote, and it begins of uh, the elder to the elect lady and her children. Uh, so we know that all of these letters were uh, circulated in the in the early church, whether they were uh, intended for one church or not. But I think we see a great difference here between the first and second letter that letters that John wrote in that the first letter seemed to be a circular letter, a letter that was actually intended for several churches because it, it lacked um, both the author's name and it lacked the uh, addressees. There was no indication of where the letter was supposed to go. And here we see some very specifics. We see that John identifies himself as the elder and he is writing to uh, the elect lady and her children, either a, an individual or a church, and we'll talk about that more in just a minute. But we can see quite a lot of differences there, and yet as we get into the content of the letter, I think we'll see that there are many similarities. It's really clear, again, that whoever wrote First John wrote Second John and also the Gospel of John, and it seems that the only real um, contender for that is the Apostle John. Historically, he's always been the one who has been named as the author of, of all of the, all three of those uh, documents. John identifies himself as the elder, and that shows there's a definite article. The word the is the definite article, and it indicates that he is not an elder um, in, in a congregation. You remember that Peter in his letters, identified himself as a fellow elder, uh, as well as an apostle. Uh, but John identifies himself as the elder, and it appears that that is a um, that he is filling a higher position. Uh, it's clear that everyone in the early church uh, knew at this time that John was the last surviving apostle, and uh, it's very possible that they gave him this honorable title of the elder. It could even mean the principal authority. And he speaks that way uh, to, uh, to all that he writes to. as They're his dear children. It's like he is shepherding them as the great shepherd under, under Jesus Christ uh, for these people. And he sends it to someone called the elect lady and her children. Now, it is certainly possible that he's writing to an individual person and to her children. Uh, but... Most translators and commentators believe that this is a metaphorical way of addressing a local church and, church and its members. And here's some of the reasons why. First of all, at this time in Christian history, that is at the end of the uh, first century, the church was under a lot of persecution. And for this reason, when letters were written, oftentimes they tried to safeguard the names of the uh, recipients by using some kind of a innocuous name as a des designation for the church. And some of you remember that, I think it was in First Peter when we were talking about that whole issue, that I had mentioned that for years we supported a missionary uh, under, the, uh, under the agency of, of Campus Crusade who was working with Muslims. And because of that, she was not allowed to indicate where she was working. And so she would always send her newsletters as information from Wonderland. That was where she was working, Wonderland, where you couldn't find that on the map. And it was really to protect the, the people and the ministry that, that, she was, uh, that she was a part of. And I think that's probably what is happening here as well. In addition, the New Testament uh, often symbolically represents the church as a woman. Um, in Ephesians 5, we see that the church is the bride of Christ, and she is referred to as a she uh, all through those passages. And then at the very end of this letter, um, it is said that the children of your sister send their greetings. And again, what makes the most sense is that John is talking here about another congregation, um, and this is the congregation that he belongs to, is the one that's sending greetings to this particular fellowship. And so I think it does make sense to see this letter as going to a church and not to an individual. 
and her children, of course, then are the members of the congregation, um, those who, who belong to that fellowship. And John greets them in, in a very important way. Um, he's done this throughout both letters. One of the key factors for John in, in, in determining Christian fellowship is truth. And so he begins, whom I love in the truth, that is, John loves his readers who just like him are in the truth, that is, and when John says in the truth, what he means is that they are faithful to the truth of the gospel that they have gotten from the very beginning. They've never departed from that. And then he says, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. So there's this community of believers drawn together by truth. And uh, I think John writes this to be an encouragement uh, to, to, the, to overcome the doubts of, of, of many of these who were being misled by, uh, or at least upset by these false teachers. And we'll see these false teachers are a major part of this letter as they were a part of 1 John. But I wanted to just spend a moment here to talk about the importance of our unity and our fellowship and our oneness in truth, uh, even before we get to the grace, mercy, and peace. Because too often, uh, what we see today happening is we see uh, a unity that does not involve truth. It's a, it's a, a forced unity. And, uh, and we do a lot of things for the sake of unity without realizing that truth needs to be involved in that, um, in that process. And just to give you an example, and this is older, I, I was thinking a few years ago, and I went and looked it up, and it's actually been about uh, 15 years ago, um, which shows how quickly time passes, and my mind doesn't pick that up. But um, there was a group of evangelical theologians and Catholic theologians who got together and decided that there were no longer any differences uh, between them with regard to the gospel, and they signed a document called um, Evangelicals and, and Catholics um, together. And some of the signers of that, uh, of that uh, document were actually key leaders in the evangelical movement. They were Charles Colson, Bill Bright, J.I. Packer, Oz Guinness, Pat Robertson. And, uh, and so it created quite a stir in the, in the community, especially in the evangelical community, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but, uh, but it was serious enough that many of the evangelical uh, theologians like uh, R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur actually took these men to task and said, look, the Roman Catholic Church has never, has never changed its view of the doctrine, uh, their doctrine of the gospel, which is a false gospel. It's, it's not the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to be studying uh, in a little bit the, the book of Revelation or the letter to the, the church in Galatia. And Paul says, if anyone teaches another gospel other than the one you've heard from me, let him be anathema. Let him be cursed of God. It's that serious that we keep the gospel pure. And yet there was this attempt by evangelicals and Catholics to unite together over the gospel. Now, we can do a lot of things with the Catholics. We can... We can fight abortion. We can deal with homosexual issues. We can help feed the hungry. Uh, Roman Catholics are very involved in, in Operation Christmas Child. Uh, they have uh, their own agency, but many of them are involved with Samaritan's Purse. So there's a lot of things we can do together, but together for the gospel is not one of them. And, uh, and I think John is, is trying to be very clear here. Um, the, the true unity that believers have is over a common belief in the gospel as it's presented in in scripture and that yes. particularly focuses on who jesus is and what he's done for his people now i sense there was a question yeah yeah just just as a comment because the people that you have named have been very well respected in the evangelical community and everything that they have written there for now I have, it has to be suspect if they feel that there's no difference between the gospel that we that that is preached to us 
versus the gospel that the Catholics preach, how can there be fellowship? And now, um, how can I even trust what I'm reading but from one of those men? I think in part, and now a few of them um, did, did relent. I, I think J.I. Packer didn't come out completely and say that he was wrong, but he, but he did kind of hint at it that, that, he had, that he had been presumptuous. I think in part, um, well, I think there's two parts, uh, Meredith. One is that the, the, the um, survey that we've been looking at here in recent weeks that was taken among evangelicals show that many evangelicals don't seem to know what the true gospel is, and that's a problem. Now, you're right, for these men, they should know the difference. And I think perhaps in their, in their defense, they were trying to find a common ground and were just careless in looking for what that common ground was. But you're right, um, the, the, the seriousness of this was because they carried such weight in the community. And even though Billy Graham did not sign this document, Billy Graham has come out and said very clearly that, that he does not he does not see any difference between uh, his God, the gospel that he believes in and that of the Roman Catholic Church. And so um, Billy Graham also a great influence and a great man used of God in many, many ways. Um, I think it's a very foolish statement to say when it's, it's very obvious that there are huge differences uh, between the Roman Catholic gospel and ours. But I think what John is saying is we need to be careful here. We, we, we can do many, many things uh, with unbelievers and even with those who don't agree with us on the gospel, but true fellowship and true uh, unity and true oneness that John is talking about here comes only through the truth. And that's why it's so important. You have to know and have to believe what scripture says about Jesus Christ. That's, that's the key. And that's where he has focused his time and energy all through the first letter and now into the second one. Um, and I just want to emphasize that because we're in a day when this is more and more and more being compromised by evangelicals, not by Catholics <laughs> and, and not by others. Um, evangelicals are starting to slip. They're the ones that are at fault. We're the ones that are going over there and saying everything's fine when they haven't changed at all. And, and so John ties even his greeting into truth. Uh, he talks about grace and mercy and peace. And again, uh, that's a standard greeting, but so, uh, so important for Christians because mercy is uh, God viewing our misery in our sinful estate, uh, having a tenderness, a love toward us, and then giving us his grace, which is uh, basically giving us, uh, showing us in love a way to have a relationship with him, which we could not obtain on our own because of our sinfulness. And then having the peace, which I listed a whole bunch of things because this is the peace, the shalom, uh, which was more of a, a comprehensive word for all of the things that came with a proper relationship with God, harmony, trust, rest, uh, safety, freedom, all of those things go together uh, as a result of the peace that comes only through relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice that John says all of this comes uh, in truth and love. These virtues flourish only in an environment where there is truth and love. We have to love, but it has to be in truth. The one other thing I think, well, two other things. One is that this is an unusual greeting in that normally it's a, it's a prayer. May grace, mercy, and peace be with you. Where here John says, it will be with you. It's a declaration that these things are yours as believers in Christ. They're already yours, and they'll continue to be yours. Um, and I think that's an important distinction. What, again, I think he's trying to do with his readers and with us is to encourage us. If we get down, if we question whether we have grace, mercy, and peace, we do if we're in Christ Jesus. It's already ours, and God gives it on a daily basis to us as we need it even more. And notice it comes from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son. Uh, again, I think John does states it this way 
because he's dealing with these false teachers. Now, you remember the false teachers uh, didn't believe that Jesus Christ was truly God. Uh, and so when John testifies that Jesus is the true Son of God the Father, and that these blessings come to us from both the Father and the Son, he's, he's essentially saying God the Father and Jesus Christ are one. They are equal. Um, they are both God. They are two different persons of the Godhead. And so he's even, even in his greeting, he's reminding his people um, that the false teachers are wrong and establishing the true doctrine that Jesus Christ is truly God. So that's the introduction. And then he begins, and again, he's still focused on this concept of truth. He says, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth. Now, at first thought, that sounds like, well, if some of them are walking in the truth, it looks like a bunch of them are not. Uh, but I don't think that's really what he meant to say. And the reason is, is because if that were true, I think we would have some indication in the rest of the letter uh, that that was the situation that, and that, that he was addressing. But he never makes any mention in this letter that there are some who have gone after the false teachers or are not walking in the way that they should. So I think it's best to understand that phrase to simply mean that John has heard of some of them of, as walking in the truth, the others he doesn't know about. And so um, he is commending the ones that he's aware of for walking again in that truth. And again, that concept walking in the truth means that they're living according to the truth of the gospel. Their life is in harmony with that word. And then John says, just as we were commanded by the Father. <clears throat> that is, he's equating the gospel message with the Father's command. And back in 1 John 3.23, he actually says that. He says, um, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. So you see there, we are to believe in the name of Christ and love one another. So those two go together, and they've gone together in John's message all the way through. And here again, he's just reminding us, I think, that these two things stand together. The command of God is that we embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that as a result of that, we love each other. I think here, John's purpose is to reinforce the believer's commitment to the truth by telling them how much joy um, their doing so brings, uh, brings to him. I think if we think about it as individuals, we're always encouraged when people tell us how much joy they got out of something we did or something we, we did for them or something that we did that we didn't even think about, but it, it brought great joy to them. Um, and I think too often we forget that one of the great joys ought to be for us when we see people living according to the gospel. We sh that should bring us joy. We should be thrilled when we see each other doing the things that we ought to be doing. And John's not afraid to say so, and neither is Paul. Paul says uh, to many of the churches that he writes to that they bring him great joy and comfort when he sees them walking the way they should. And so that should challenge us. We should be that way toward each other. And I think we would encourage each other more if we did, and also we'd, we'd have more joy in our lives because we would see the joy that comes from seeing fellow believers um, faithful to their Savior. And then he goes on, and now I ask you, dear lady, now I, I skipped a part, that we love one another. This is the sentence. The other part is, uh, is modifies the sentence, but the sentence is, I ask you, dear lady, that we love one another. He's saying that um, he, he desires to, to see that love that he has for them and that they have for him to continue and, uh, and grow. That there is this mutual love between these two fellowships, which he desires to see continue. But he reminds them, as he did um, in that first letter, uh, to those that he's writing to. And by the way, there's, uh, these letters are very similar, but they don't appear to be sent to the same people, and there is no indication that the people to whom the second letter was written would have 
already read the first letter. Uh, they are really separate letters, but they cover many of the same topics. And you recall in 1 John, he, he writes essentially the same thing. Not as though I were writing you a new commandment. This is not new. It's the one we have had from the beginning. Again, he's not trying to lay on them another obligation, another requirement. He's just calling them to obey the command that they received when they first heard the gospel. And that is... Um, Receive Jesus as Lord and Savior and love other people. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to take you back for just a moment into the Gospel of John. Uh, a couple places. One of, the, uh, one of the beautiful sections of the Gospel of John is the upper room discourse that Jesus has with his disciples on the very night in which he was betrayed. And uh, this is the time when... When Jesus is preparing them for what's coming, uh, they, don't, they don't completely understand what he's saying. They're kind of in denial. They can't, uh, can't really fathom completely what he's saying, but he's telling them what's going to happen, his death and, 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 and all of the things that are accompanied with that to prepare them for what's ahead so they're not surprised and they don't think that things have gone awry. He wants them to know that, that this is the way it, it needs to go. And so in chapter 13, verse 34, you remember right after he has washed their feet, he tells them a new commandment I, I, gave, I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And again, as I said before, I believe that this just was seared into John's conscience. This night and what Jesus said on that night has become uh, an Im important part of his life. And he now communicates that to others. But if we turn over to chapter 15, again, I think we see how these things come together. Um, starting in verse 10, Jesus says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So here he's saying, um, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. You will abide in me. Then he says, verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. So here again, John recognizes that what Jesus has said is, uh, you're my friends. You're one with me if you do what I ask you to do. But then if we go down um, to uh, verse 17, Jesus also adds, these things I command you so that you will love one another. So I think John is repeating the very things that Jesus has said. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And one of the commandments is that you love each other. And so he goes on with this phrase, and this is love that we walk according to his commandments. So he's really just repeating the very things that Jesus has said in the very context that Jesus gave them, because Jesus combined these things together in that upper room discourse that he gave uh, to his disciples on that night. This is the commandment so that you should walk in it. Again, he follows Jesus' example of putting these things together. Now, the in it uh, is pretty vague. It certainly could refer to love, or could refer to the commandment itself, or it could refer to truth. Um, it could be all three, actually, but I think truth fits the best because in the very next sentence, the very next sentence begins with the word for or because, and that ties it into what John is talking about there, which are deceivers, those who have come to deceive believers. So truth is going to be a key issue all through this letter, and particularly in what he, what he begins to say next. And then again, of course, he emphasized, just as you have heard from the beginning, I don't know how many times he's used that phrase, but again, he wants to remind them, it's what you originally heard, the gospel message you originally heard. That's the true gospel. What you've been hearing lately from these false teachers is not. 
and you need to stick with what you heard from the beginning. And I think we'll see how important that is as we go along. Let me just take a moment to see if there's any questions or comments about what we've looked at so far. Okay, starting in verse seven then, He says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. Uh, the conjunction four, again, pulls us back into the, into the prior verse, enables us to see why John regards truth so important and walking in the truth is so important because there are people out there who are trying to deceive believers. And these deceivers um, here have gone out into the world. That is, they've left the Christian community and they've joined with the world system that's opposed to God. And uh, I gave you some references there to uh, what he said in 1 John. We're going to come back to 1 John 2.19 in just a moment. But what he's referring to is these false teachers. And uh, you'll recall that uh, according to 1 John, these false teachers were at one time associated with the Christian community. Uh, they were... I guess we could say they were professing Christians, at least in word. Uh, they certainly weren't in deed, and they certainly weren't in doctrine, but they were professing Christians according to their own confession initially, and then they walked away from that fellowship out into the world where they have spent their time trying to deceive the believers um, around them. And he makes it clear who these people are, in the next phrase, because he said, they are those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Now, here again, these false teachers, what they denied was, number one, that Jesus Christ is, in fact, God. Uh, they denied that he was divine. They also denied that he came in the flesh, that is, that he took on um, human a human body and he actually lived among us. They denied the incarnation of Christ. And third, they denied that, that Jesus, as the Son of God, actually died on the cross. So they denied that Christ actually made a sacrificial or a, a, a sacrificial atonement for the sins of the people. In fact, you'll remember that these teachers didn't even believe that they had sinned, so they really didn't see a need for an atonement. Sometimes John shortens all of that down to Jesus Christ come in the flesh, but he is really referring to the whole teaching about Jesus coming as the divine second person of the Trinity to take on human flesh and to make an atoning sacrifice for the sins of God's people. The other thing is in the New Testament, the expression, the one who is coming uh, is a messianic designation. And so John is very careful to say that um, here, the coming of Jesus Christ, when he says it that way, he means again to, to take to task the false teachers and give a testimony to those who are denying that truth. Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And so John says, such a one, that is, these deceivers, such a one is a deceiver, that is, these who don't believe the truth about Jesus Christ, they're, a de they're the deceiver and the antichrist. Um, now, John uses the singular form here, deceiver and antichrist. And he, what he seems to be implying here is that although there are many deceivers and there are many antichrists, and he's been talking about that in his first letter, too, that there are those who are already out there acting as antichrists. They're already in the world. Um, but I think what he's saying in using the singular here is they're doing the work that the true or the final antichrist will be doing. And their task is clearly to deceive people. That's their whole goal of existence is to deceive believers and lead them astray. That's an awful thing to say about someone, but when we look at those who don't believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's essentially what they're doing. They're presenting a different gospel, a gospel that will not save people, 
um, and they're seeking to deceive them into thinking that this is something that they can rely on. Doug? Yes. Can, can there be a deceiver, but not an antichrist? You know, kind of like with the example that you told earlier in uh, last year, I saw a couple YouTube videos of like Max Lakato and Hayford bowing down in front of people who are involved in the woke movement, confessing the whiteness, the sin of the whiteness of our, you know, of our community and our church. And that was really difficult to hear and to watch. And, you know, both these people, I think, confess Jesus as the savior and the run to God, but they're deceiving the church by doing what they did. I think to answer your question, yes, uh, there can be deception in areas that don't make one an antichrist. Um, yeah. We can deceive in a lot of different ways. And some of those deceptions have nothing to do with the gospel itself, but other teachings of scripture. Antichrist means opposed to Christ, coming in the place of Christ or trying to replace the Christ. Um, and so that really has to do directly with the gospel. Um, if you oppose the gospel of Jesus Christ, then even though you didn't mean to, you can be an antichrist to others because you're opposing the very thing that the gospel is all about. Um, so when someone, even like Billy Graham, who says, I don't see any difference between the gospel that I preach and that which is taught by the Roman Catholic Church, at that point, he is being, um, maybe unknown to himself, he is being an antichrist because he's opposing the true gospel. He knows the true gospel, he proclaims the true gospel, but he is willing to say to others, you can find the true gospel in the Roman Catholic Church, and you can't. And so uh, we need to be really careful because we can deceive ourselves. Uh, but yes, to answer your question, I think that there is deception. Um, there is error in the church that would not make one directly an antichrist because it wouldn't directly affect the gospel. And I'm sure that I'm guilty of, <laughs> of some of that, you know, over the years, I've had to change my view of scripture many times. And I have to say to God, you know, I was wrong when I thought that was true. I was wrong even when I taught it. Um, because now I see now that it, that it, it, it wasn't biblical. Um, I thought it was at the time. And so I think all of us go through that process as we learn that we realize there are times when maybe we are deceivers because we think we have the right answer and we don't, uh, which means we always have to be growing. We always have to be looking back at scripture. We always have to be sure that we are doing the very best we can to present the truth of the word of God. And that's not always an easy thing. Doug? Uh, yeah. I, I get and what Barbara was talking about. I think that Max Lucado himself had been deceived and didn't realize it and therefore practiced that untruth or whatever it was. So sometimes we're deceived. Yes. And, um, and, and like you say, then you come to the point, hey, I was wrong. That basically you had been deceived in some way. And now your, your understanding has been corrected by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes, we can be deceived and, and we need to be careful not to be. And, and if we are, if we see that we are, we need to be bold enough to, to say that we have so that we don't continue to deceive others by what we've said. If we're wrong, we need to correct it. We need to say we were wrong and we need to, to give the correct understanding. And I think that's where the difficulty sometimes is, is uh, when these leaders are deceived, they've been slow at coming back and saying, <laughs> I was deceived and you should not have followed my example, or please don't continue to follow my example in this area. But I think that's where we need to be bold and say, look, you know, um, I've discovered that the word of Christ is not what I thought it was there or where I, where I was misled and, and, um, and come clean. And, and that will help the Christian community to understand the truth. Um, I gave you in your notes, uh, which I think Paul has got here too, uh, just a, a summary of the Bible's teaching on the Antichrist, because it seems to be a big theme with John, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but just to give you a, a, 
some general um, teachings on the Antichrist, the general concept of a powerful end time figure opposed to God is found in um, Jewish apocalyptic writings, some biblical, some not. Uh, so, for example, the book of Daniel, uh, the book of Isaiah, uh, the book of Zechariah, we have some of those teachings, but we ha also have this whole concept in the book of Enoch and some of the other uh, intertestamental books that Protestants don't accept as, as the Bible, but they're in those writings as well. Uh, also, uh, the coming of a powerful Antichrist figure was part of early Christian teaching. It's very clear that it is in the scriptures as well, even if in a general sense, and that these early teachings distinguish between a great Antichrist figure who will appear near the end of time and what John is calling these lesser Antichrist figures who are already exerting their influence in the Christian church now. Back then and also today, we still have these lesser Antichrists who are out there seeking to deceive people. And we need to realize that this is an ongoing thing. They may not be the final Antichrist, but they are deceivers. And we need to be careful that we're not deceived by their teachings. Um, because, again, one of the teachings is that uh, one, one of the things that we recognize is the function of both the final Antichrist and these lesser Antichrists is to deceive people, specifically believers, but even uh, unbelievers can be deceived into thinking that what they're telling them is correct and they, they're willing to follow them. And so we need to be really careful. Um, first and second John indicates that, uh, that uh, well, let me back up. The New Testament apart from 1st and 2nd John, shows that the Antichrist figures attack from without, and uh, sometimes this carries political overtones with it. 1st uh, and 2nd John are the only books in the Bible that indicate that these people were former members of the Christian community, which is interesting. Uh, they were a part of the church uh, for a time and then left. And the other thing I think we need to realize is while human beings certainly function as Antichrist figures, the depiction of the Antichrist at the end time suggests a superhuman being in opposition to God and his purposes. That is a person who is so controlled by Satan that it's really Satan acting uh, through this person um, that will arise at the very end um, and is outlined particularly in the book of Revelation. And so John says then, watch yourselves. This is, uh, he doesn't give a lot of commands in these letters, um, but this is one of them. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for. Now here again, there's a number of uh, significant textual variations. Um, and this, it seems like the most reliable phrase is what we have worked for. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you may note, uh, some of them have a note at the bottom uh, or at the bottom of the text, which also says, um, or you have, or you have worked for. Some of the um, less reliable manuscripts have you, and it's easy to see how a scribe might change the we to you to make it more uniform. It's difficult to see how a scribe would want to change it from you to we. Um, so it appears that what John is saying is that he has been working along with others to make known the truth of Jesus Christ to these believers so that they might know God, so they might have eternal life. Um, and uh, that's why he's warning them. Uh, you need to remain in the teaching of Christ. That comes up in the very next verse. Uh, they've worked together uh, on this. Um, it's not a works-oriented thing, but John is saying, I've worked hard um, to help you to understand the gospel and trust the gospel and trust the person and work of Jesus Christ. Um, and he says, I want you to be careful that you don't lose that, but may win a full reward. So I, I was hoping that the full reward would be something other than eternal life, because here again, we have that struggle with the word. But if we look up the word reward as it's used dozens of times in the New Testament, 
it always means the blessings in the age to come. So again, he is talking about either eternal life and or the rewards of the good works that we do as, as those who are in Christ. Um, and again, I think then what he is saying to us here is um, that you can't, uh, let me back up and say, the, the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints is that those who are truly in Christ, uh, truly made a commitment to Christ, and, uh, and are trusting in Christ, cannot lose their salvation. But that same doctrine also teaches that the way we know that is that those who love the Lord do not walk away from him. God protects them in such a way that they won't walk away. And John has been saying all along that one of the proofs that we have um, of our assurance in Christ is that we remain faithful to the gospel. And, and he's also said, those who don't remain faithful to the gospel, it is obvious that they don't belong to the fellowship of believers. And that's where I think the verse in 1 John 2, 19 is so important. That's why I said I'd come back to it in, in just a minute, because I think what John says there is a great summary of how we see the difference between believers and unbelievers, regardless of what they say. He says, these talking about the false teachers, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. If they really were true believers, they wouldn't have left. That's part of the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. If you really love the Lord, you're not going to leave him. He's not going to leave you, but you won't leave him either because he won't allow that to happen. But we went out, but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. They left so that we could see they weren't true believers. True believers won't leave. False believers at some point in time will walk away. And so that was the, the message that we saw in the book uh, of Hebrews, in the letter to the Hebrews, as the writer said, if you see people starting to fall away from the Lord, they're in danger because they're movement toward apostasy is proof that, or is at this point, maybe suggestion that maybe they don't really have the faith that they claim to have, because true believers, um, true, true believers can stray, but they will never walk away from the truth. And so John, again, is giving, I think, that same warning that the writer to the Hebrews said um, when he says, be careful uh, because if you start to listen to these false teachers, you could start to move in that direction, and it may be an indication that you really don't believe the truth of the gospel. Now, I think, did somebody have a question, concern? Okay, I think he supports that with the very next phrase as well, because he goes on to say, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. So John here again is dealing with these false teachers and saying that we need to be very careful if we start to run after new and spurious idea, ideas instead of continuing in the teachings of Christ. Um, the teachings of Christ, again, I think are the teachings that Jesus gave us, but also the teachings that scripture gives us about Christ. And he says that these people do not have God. That is, if you venture beyond the truth of the gospel um, and you adhere to that with, with, with your belief, you are not going to be in fellowship with God. There's always this danger um, of being led astray by things that sound novel and interesting and new and different. Um, and, I, and, and, and there's a lot of that out there. And I want you to know that uh, I was thinking the, the other day about even Martin Luther. Uh, most, most of you know Martin Luther was the one who started the Protestant Reformation. And when he was brought before um, the, uh, the Catholic Council at, the, at, the, um, at, the, at Worms, the trial that, that they were having on him, um, 
he felt all alone. And he, he, he even asked the question of himself, am I the only one who believes these things about the gospel? Um, even though uh, he believed that he was right, he questioned himself because he found it hard to believe that he was the only one who was seeing this truth. And what really, what God did to help him was that uh, at, the, at this uh, trial, the Catholics brought out the fact that his teaching was the same as John Huss, who had been previously declared a heretic and burned at the stake. And Luther admitted that he had never read anything by Huss. And so the council gave him a few uh, uh, some time to look over the teachings of Huss, and Luther realized that in Huss, um, they believed the same things. He was not the only one. There were others who believed this truth, and it gave him confidence to say, I'm standing on the scripture, and I, I can't be swayed. Unless you can show me from scripture, uh, I'm not going to change my view. Uh, but we always have to be concerned about that. Um, just to give you another example, uh, one of the things that the Mormon church tells us is that for almost 2,000 years, the truth um, of the Bible was lost by the church, and it was restored uh, by the angel Moroni giving the truth to Joseph Smith. Um, the problem with that is Jesus himself, on the night he was betrayed, said, I'm going to give you an advocate. I'm going to give you a paraclete who will lead you into all truth. This was his promise to the disciples, that they would be protected in the truth by the Holy Spirit. If for 2,000 years the church has lost that truth, then Jesus lied to us um, there. He, he said that we would know the truth, and we didn't know it until the Mormon church came about. And I think it's one of the fallacies um, of, that, of that teaching, is that it denies that the church has known the truth, and that God protects the truth and those who believe in it. Uh, and we, but we need to be careful that we don't go after these novel ideas. That's what these false teachers were presenting, novel, different ideas about who Jesus Christ was. And John says, if you follow that, um, you're, you're not in a relationship with God. You do not know him. But whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Uh, no one has the Father without the Son. You can't have a relationship with God the Father without going through the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, but if you have uh, a relationship with one, you have a relationship with the other. Um, and really, you have both of them indwelling you through the power of the Holy Spirit. You have God living within you. The triune God lives within you um, because of what Christ has done uh, for you on the cross. Now, at this point, I believe John is giving us some very important teaching about how we have to handle truth and how we have to handle those who are not, who are deceivers, who are false teachers. And uh, this is what these next two verses are about. He says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, that is, the teaching that he's been talking about, the teachings of Christ, uh, referred to in the previous verse. That is the message these readers have heard from the beginning. If they bring a different message than that, then do not receive them, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. <laughs> so, um, you remember that other passages in Scripture talk about how important it is to provide hospitality for those who come around uh, in in the in the in the community. And John, in, in his third in his third letter, will talk about how important that hospitality is. But I think here John is giving us some very practical steps to limit the influence of these false teachers. Um, now, there's two possibilities here, but I think they blend into each other when we stop and think about um, what the culture was like and what why John is saying what he's saying here. The first is he could be simply saying, um, could be talking about receiving someone into one's home, that is providing that person with hospitality. 
back then, um, those who were welcomed and provided hospitality <clears throat> to travelers really provided them with a, I put a patronage, but it really is, it's a standing as a guest in the community. They were received as true guests because someone in the community stood up for them. And so they, they did enjoy the protection afforded by the local laws, which they otherwise had no rights to. They were considered to be welcome in the community because someone in the community stood up for them. In fact, that's why it was so important for them in many cases to have letters of recommendation so that the person they were going to had some confidence that they weren't true strangers. They, they had a recommendation from someone who knew them before maybe a common, um, a, a common uh, a person that both knew, and, and therefore uh, they were more willing to make this commitment. But it was a, a very serious and important thing that one did when one took someone into their home. Um, but also the home was used, uh, especially at this time, as a house church. Many homes, in fact, most of the churches met in homes at the time. And so John could be saying, uh, talking about receiving an, an itinerant preacher in the assembly of a house church. And he's basically saying, do not receive uh, um, heretical teachers into the assembly of the church and don't give them an opportunity uh, to propagate their beliefs. And I think this is a, a critical thing. Uh, you notice he goes on, or give them any greeting. Uh, couple things about what a greeting did. Number one is it uh, a Christian greeting generally carried a recognition of the Christian standing of those being greeted. So if you greeted another Christian, you were essentially saying this person is a believer in Jesus Christ. If others did not know that person, you would be the one saying you can trust this person as a believer in Jesus Christ. It also conferred a blessing upon that person. And so John is saying, if false teachers come to you, you can't greet them in that way. They don't deserve that status. You cannot let them have your pulpit. Um, and that is true today. It's not as important for us as it is for the pastors. But Pastor Terry has that obligation anytime he relinquishes his pulpit, his preaching ministry to someone else. Does this person know Jesus Christ? Does this person preach or teach the gospel? It can be a missionary that comes to town. It can be someone like Tom Hoyle. Uh, it can be uh, someone else. But anytime you allow someone else to preach in your church, you're saying you agree with what that person is telling the congregation. So you better be sure that you know what they believe. And that's what John is saying here. Do not allow these people to come in and, and don't give them the blessing of hospitality or even the privilege of preaching in your church if their views are contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here's why. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. You are associating with that person uh, when you do that. Uh, you are recognizing them as valid Christian, in, in a valid Christian standing with the community. And so, if they're teaching false doctrine, uh, you are espousing that false doctrine. And I think that's some of the things we've been seeing. Um, maybe not, we've never seen it in our church since I've been there, but we see it in the Christian community. Um, and I think some of you have mentioned that. Uh, some have been deceived. Some with, with outstanding Christian credentials have been deceived. And because they have aligned themselves with those who are teaching false teaching, they've led others to believe that that false teaching is okay. So we really need to be careful of that. And then just briefly, let me conclude. Um, I think we have time to do this. The last two verses are just really a, a conclusion that, that John gives. He, he says, though I have much to write about, I would rather not use paper and ink. He's written these things because these are so important, he can't wait. Um, but he says, instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face. Literally, what he says is mouth to mouth. Um, and that means person to person. Uh, when when uh, Paul says 
uh, then we will meet Jesus face to face. He does not use the same words here, and he does not mean the same thing. He's talking about we will know Jesus in a way that we don't know him now in glory. What Paul is talking, or what John is talking about here is person to person. I'd rather talk to you person to person where I can experience, I can see you walking in the truth. I can encourage you to continue to walk in the truth. I can tell you things that I don't want to put on paper now. Um, and where I can ensure that you continue to walk in the truth, and in doing so, uh, you will make the joy that I already have complete. Uh, and so I long to be with you, and of course, you remember Paul said that to several of the congregations, I long to be with you, I hope to be with you soon, so I can enjoy that fellowship, and that's really what John is saying, I've written to you these things because I needed to, but I really want to sit down face to face with you and, and talk some more. And then this final greeting which again, I believe is uh, from the church that John is in. He says, the children of your elect sister greet you. Uh, and so, um, whoops, turn the page. Um, here again, it appears that he's still using this anonymous use of the word. Uh, you remember that in, in Peter, uh, Peter says, uh, she who is in Babylon greets you. Um, Again, that was probably a, a reference to Christians in the church in Rome. And so here John is saying, this congregation that he's in, he calls the children of your elect sister, they greet you. So we have the letter written to the elect lady and her children, one congregation from another, the children of your elect sister. Um, it's kind of exciting to see that, but that's probably what is happening here. And John is conveying simply the greetings of the members of the local church of which he is which he belongs. Now, he may be their pastor, or he may just be um, serving a, a, a more, a greater role for the whole Christian community, but he's worshiping in the church from which he sends greetings. 